Welcome to this video on idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Before we begin, consider the following questions. How can you diagnose idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss? What are the leading theories on why it develops? Which investigations are helpful in diagnosing this? How do you treat this? Which factors should you consider when administrating intratrepanic steroids? And what hearing rehabilitation options exist following sudden sensory hearing loss? Idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss is characterized by a rapid onset hearing loss, typically in one ear, though it can be bilateral. The hearing loss occurs over a period of 72 hours or less and may be accompanied by tinnitus, aural fullness and sometimes vertigo. Importantly, there are no symptoms of infection, such as pain or discharge. Otoscopy should be performed to exclude any wax impaction or obvious abnormalities of the tympanic membrane, such as infection, perforation or middle ear effusion. In primary care, tuning fork tests should support a sensory neural loss, with air conduction being greater than bone conduction on rinnies and Weber's lateralizing to the contralateral ear. The diagnosis is confirmed with audiometry. A sensory neural hearing loss of at least 30 decibels across three consecutive frequencies on a pure audiogram occurring within three days or less confirms the diagnosis of sudden sensory neural hearing loss. But to call this idiopathic, other potential causes such as infections, trauma, ototoxic drug exposure or tumours such as vestibular schwannomas must be ruled out. Idiopathic sudden sensory hearing loss is therefore a diagnosis of exclusion. The exact cause is unclear, but there are a number of theories that have been proposed. The inner ear is metabolically very fragile and disruptions in the ear's microcirculation, either due to a virus, a microvascular event or an autoimmune flare, can all result in sensory loss. While pure tone audiometry is the primary test to diagnose sudden sensory hearing loss as it quantifies the degree and type of hearing loss, other investigations are useful to rule out other causes. An MRI scan of the internal audiometrius is essential to rule out retrocochlear pathology such as vestibular schwannoma or other CPA lesions. Blood tests are not routinely recommended unless a specific cause is suspected. Historically, a battery of tests including ANCA, ANA, sarcoidosis screen, Lyme disease screen, syphilis and HIV testing was often recommended, but routine testing rarely yields findings that alter management. And so blood tests are best reserved for cases where an underlying cause is suspected. Idiopathic sudden sensory hearing loss is a medical emergency that requires prompt diagnosis and treatment to maximise the chances of hearing recovery. Treatment should begin as soon as possible, ideally within the first three days of symptom onset, but certainly within 14 days. Oral corticosteroids are the first line of treatment, and a common regimen involves high-dose prednisolone at 1 mg per kilogram to a maximum of 60 mg once daily for 7 to 10 days. Steroids help to reduce the inflammation and immune-mediated damage in the inner ear. A patient should be counseled on possible side effects including hyperglycemia, insomnia and weight gain and should be covered with gastric protection. If all steroids are contraindicated or if there is an incomplete response, intratympanic steroid injections can be administered directly into the middle ear. This allows a higher concentration of the drug to reach the inner ear while minimizing systemic side effects. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is sometimes used as an adjunct, particularly within the first two weeks. The idea is to increase oxygen delivery to the cochlea, which may aid recovery. There are a few centers, however, that offer hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and patients should receive tympanosomy tubes prior to this. Finally, although the viral theory of sudden sensory hearing loss is prevalent, Antiviral treatment is not routinely recommended unless there is evidence of an active infection. When considering intratrepanic steroids, several factors need to be addressed, including the choice of steroid, the timing and frequency of steroid administration and the procedure itself. Dexamethasone and methylprednisolone are most frequently used. Methylprednisolone has better penetration of the round window and maintains a higher concentration in the perilymph compared to dexamethasone. However, it must be buffered and the buffering solution tends to cause significant discomfort. In contrast, dexamethasone causes less discomfort but has less bioavailability within the perilymph. Early intervention with intratrepanic steroids, especially within the first two weeks of onset, is most effective. 
They are usually reserved as a salvage treatment in cases where the patient has not responded to oral steroids. Due to logistical reasons, serial injections are usually offered one week apart, with all geometry provided before each injection to assess for response. However, as methylprednisolone only remains detectable within the perilymph for 24 hours, while dexamethasone only remains for 6 hours, more frequent administrations may be preferable. The procedure is tolerated well under topical local anesthesia, and to minimize any discomfort or caloric effect, it is helpful to gently warm the steroid prior to administration. In addition to the injection site, placing a separate needle hole anterosuperiorly allows for air to escape from the middle ear as a steroid is administered. This helps to reduce aural pressure symptoms. Younger patients may require general anesthetic, and so placing a tympanostomy tube allows for easier subsequent administrations either through injection or by using dexamethasone eardrops and applying tragal pressure multiple times a day, irrespective of how steroids are administered intratrepanically. In approximately 30% of cases, the round window niche may be obstructed by a mucosal web or adhesion. As such, regardless of how the steroid is administered, they may not effectively reach the inner ear. The timing of the first steroid administration is the most significant prognostic factor with patients treated within seven days having the best outcomes. As time progresses, steroid administration within 14 days still offers benefits compared to no steroids, but beyond 28 days, there is limited benefit from steroid use. Other factors that affect the prognosis include the severity of the hearing loss, the patient's age, any concomitant cardiovascular disease, and the presence of vertigo with first presentation of hearing loss, all of which are associated with poorer outcomes. Recovery can be considered complete or partial as defined by either the American Association criteria, the Frausche criteria or the Siegel's criteria. There are a number of hearing rehabilitation options for patients who do not make a full recovery. Where the patient still has serviceable hearing, hearing aids can be used to amplify the sound. With severe or profound losses, options to transmit the sound from the affected side to the unaffected side include bicross aids or bone conduction implants. These can help to reduce head shadow and listening effort. Finally, and although not currently funded by NICE in the UK, cochlear implants can be used to restore binaural hearing. Many patients with sensory hearing loss may also experience tinnitus, and so tinnitus retraining therapy, such as sound therapy, counselling and relaxation, can also be helpful. I hope you found this video to be useful. Please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.